Thank you, sir. So we would now like to invite Mr. Shamdevan to deliver the DTVAS lecture. Thank you. Hi, a very good morning to all of you. Vice Chancellor, Dr. Chakrabarti, Justice Ashim Kumar Roy, um, Dr. Sardindu Basu on the dais, Justice Girish Gupta, uh, members of the faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here to deliver the 13th Durga Das Basu Endowment Lecture. And I thank the Vice Chancellor for extending this invitation to me. In small measure, I'm here to repay a debt to a jurist whose written word has silently shaped our jurisprudence and our society. Like many of you in the audience, my first encounter with Dr. Basu took place when I was in government law college preparing for a moot court. And we naturally looked to the shorter constitution as a clear guide. Later, as a junior in the, count in the chambers of the eminent Mumbai practitioner Firdos Talyar Khan, shorter constitution was our Bible. Groomed away from Calcutta, however, in that other great metropolis, Mumbai, I must confess that there was a certain parochial allegiance that I owed another constitutional scholar, H. M. Sirvai. But for a budding practitioner, Basu's shorter constitution was quite easily sort of raced past any rival competition. It was always clear, it was always very pithy, it was precise, it was beautifully indexed. And for someone who was searching for a clue in terms of this vast ocean of constitutional law to assist a senior advocate or to assist others, including judges, the port of call and the Bible was invariably the shorter constitution. It's a legacy that endures. A few weeks ago, arguing before a panel of nine judges before the Supreme Court in the Sabrimala review case, it was reassuring to be fortified by a passage from Dr. Basu's commentary. It makes the business of persuasion in the Supreme Court as a counsel much easier when you're supported by an analysis by Dr. D.D. Basu. As early as November 19, 1958, a constitution bench drew on Basu's commentary to explain how the American experience justified engrafting fundamental rights chapter into our constitution. As recently as 2018, another constitution bench extensively drew on the commentary to explain the principles of public employment in India. Equally popular as the, sh uh, as the shorter constitution are Basu's law of the press and limited government and judicial review. Each of these texts have been cited on multiple occasions by our Supreme Court and of course the high courts. Thanks to uh, Durga Das Basu's extraordinary industry and the dedication of a new team of editors, his books remain a living legacy even in this digital age. Digital age provides an inflection point to explore today's theme. The constitution and liberty, as we know, are old bedfellows. When did privacy enter the company and create a menage a trois? The freedom movement fired in the crucible of sacrifice, protest, and non-cooperation unshackled the nation from a long, dark period of colonial exploitation. The constitutional project from its inception was about gaining liberty in its manifold forms. It was and is about preserving liberty through an institutional framework that will endure for generations of Indians. As we know, liberty assured by our constitution travels far beyond the promise of political rights. The expression liberty embraces a new social contract which over time must erase the deep fissures 
that for millennia stratified Indian society. The liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship in the ringing words of the preamble to our constitution point us to the goal of creating a modern, liberal, progressive state. The command of Article 21 forges a strong bond between the individual and liberty. It reads, no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law. Edward Snowden, the brave hero who exposed how America's National Security Agency spied on its own citizens, explains the contemporary avatar of liberty. He writes, the freedom of a country can only be measured by its respect for rights of its citizens. And it is my conviction that these rights are in fact limitations of state power that define exactly where and when a government may not infringe into that domain of personal or individual freedoms. That during the American Revolution was called liberty and during the Internet Revolution is called privacy. I hope to persuade you over the course of this talk that Snowden is correct. In the Internet age, we must recognize that in order to preserve our liberty in the new interconnected reality, the spaces we must protect and regain if necessary are not the traditional spaces. Important as the integrity of our body and home was and is, preserving the ownership, control and integrity of our data is the most crucial aspect of preserving liberty. This now means protecting ourselves not just from the state, the traditional contestant in the tournament to preserve freedom, but also private behemoths, the big technology companies who harvest and sell our data. Articulation of rights during the colonial rule was both perilous and aspirational. Amongst the earliest documents providing a new imagination of governance is the Swaraj Bill of 1895. Though its provenance is uncertain, Professor S. P. Sate describes the bill as the Constitution of India Bill 1895 and consider, considers it to be the first non-official attempt at drafting a Constitution of India. Influenced by the nationalism of Bal Gangadhar Tilak, the document comprises 111 clauses. In an early formulation of a crucial aspect of privacy, that every person's home is her castle, Clause 17 of the Constitution of India Bill 1895 declares, every person has in his house an inviolable asylum. K. M. Munshi, another influential contributor to the drafting process, recounts events nearly three decades later. Writing in Pilgrimage to Freedom, he says, on November 8, 1927, the all-white Simon Commission was announced. The history of British rule of India records many wanton and foolish acts of British rulers, but none more so than the insult which Lord Birkenhead hurled at India. In a speech, the Secretary of State for India stated that he could not find suitable Indians to represent India. Responding to a challenge thrown to Indian leaders to suggest constitutional reforms, an all parties conference was devised. And on 14th August 1928, another foundational document, the Motilal Nehru Report, was published. In a section titled Fundamental Rights, Clause 4.2 sought to expand the entitlement to privacy. It reads, No person shall be deprived of his liberty, nor shall his dwelling or property be entered, sequestered or confiscated, save in accordance with law. 
The fundamental rights section proposed in the report never made it to the Government of India Bill or the Government of India Act of 1935. And the fundamental rights section had to wait until 1950 to enter our Great Charter. The notion of privacy was discussed in the committees that produced the drafts that were placed before the Constituent Assembly. On 23rd December 1946, Professor K. T. Shah submitted a comprehensive note on fundamental rights to the President of the Assembly, emphasizing the importance of a Bill of Rights. Professor K. T. Shah wrote, the most important of these relates to the liberty of the person and privacy of the home. No interference with that right can be allowed without due process of law. He suggested a number of draft clauses, including an important safeguard of privacy. And clause 55, which he suggested read, no search warrants shall be issued except on reasonable grounds, supported by oath or affirmation, and specifically describing the place to be searched, documents to be seized, or the person or thing to be apprehended if found. On 17th March 1947, barely a week later, K. M. Munshi submitted a set of draft articles on fundamental rights, suggesting in Article 5 covering rights to freedom. And in K. M. Munshi's draft as well, you have the rights to the inviolability of his home, the rights to the secrecy of his correspondence, the rights to maintain his person, secure by the law of the Union from exploitation in any manner contrary to law or public morality. Uh, drawing on the Czechoslovakian constitution of 1919, Harnam Singh proposed every dwelling shall be inviolable. So you can see there's a lot of debate and discussion going on on what was then thought to be the notion or the contours of privacy. Indeed, Dr. Ambedkar also came in on this debate and in the following week he submitted a memorandum of draft articles in which Article 2 in pertinent part read, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall be issued but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. What happened to all these proposals? The Subcommittee on Fundamental Rights submitted a report on 3rd of April 1947 to the Advisory Committee with a draft chapter on fundamental rights containing a guarantee in Clause 10 identical to Dr. Ambedkar's memorandum. However, a strong pushback ensued. The advisory committee proceedings saw these safeguards dropped. Heeding to the opinions of C. Rajagopalachari, Alladi Krishnaswami Iyer and others who felt that the provisions of the criminal procedure law were sufficient to protect citizens. This view was also informed by the opinion of B. N. Rao, the constitutional advisor, who wanted a lesser burden on Indian courts by eliminating the phrase due process from the Charter. As you know, the Constitution as adopted did not expressly use the word privacy in the Fundamental Rights Chapter. It is no surprise that in 1954, a young Supreme Court sitting our bank with all eight judges. Today, as you know, we have a strength of 34. At that time, the sanctioned strength of the Supreme Court was eight. And all eight of them sat in 1954 to decide a case known, uh, which was referred to by Justice Roy, M.P. Sharma's case. And the issue which they, or the statement of law which they made, or the observation that they made was, that the Indian Constitution did not recognize a fundamental right to privacy analogous to the American Fourth Amendment. 
and having regards to the recent constitutional drafting history which I narrated, this is really not much of a surprise. But as was mentioned, this was a bench strength of eight. The MP Sharma judgment arose in the context of the state's power to conduct search and seizure. Here, the writ petitioners asked for return of documents that were seized in the course of an investigation into whether funds were diverted from an enterprise, Dalmia Jain Airways Limited. With no express privacy guarantees, the focus of the court was on Article 23 of the Constitution which states, no person accused of any offence shall be compelled to be a witness against himself. So here you can see the innovations and the abilities of lawyers as practitioners and as judges who were compelled to decide the case. There were all these drafts and these discussions which took place in the constituent assemblies, but the lawyers for MP Sharma found that they didn't have this guaranteed right. And there was this search and seizure which was going on with respect to papers. So what is the article they use? They use the article 20 sub article 3. No person accused of an offence shall be compelled to be a witness against himself. Which is these are my documents. These searches will lead to information which can be used against me. Please don't permit it. So bringing in in an innovative manner privacy which was otherwise textually not guaranteed. They also tried another limb which was as you recall we had a fundamental right to property under article 19 1f of the constitution so the mp sharma case also looks at that and says that well is this a property right can a citizen say that this is my property and therefore you can't search and seize it in the course of an investigation which was looking into diversion of funds the court applying the rule of textual interpretation in vogue at that time did not examine other provisions to discover whether the right to privacy dwelled elsewhere in part 3, that is at, apart from article 23 and 19 1f of the constitution. We then come to Kharak Singh. Kharak Singh decided nearly a decade later, about eight and a half years later, a six-judge bench rendered a split verdict with Justice K. Subarao and Justice J. C. Shah in the minority. Kharak Singh was accused in a case of decoity in 1941 and subsequently released for want of evidence. The police, however, continued to maintain a history sheet on Singh. History sheets were personal records of criminals under surveillance. Subject to regular surveillance as a result of the UP police regulation, Singh approached the Supreme Court to enforce his right under Article 19.1d, which as you know is the right to freedom to move throughout the territory of India. And his contention was that this history sheet which you are maintaining by sending police officers to picket me every evening is violative of Article 19.1d. In Kharak Singh, the Supreme Court held that Regulation 236, which provi provides for domiciliary visits at night, was violative of Article 21. In reaching the conclusion, the majority judgment authored by Justice Iyengar recognized privacy as an ultimate essential of ordered liberty, if not the very concept of civilization. But he hesitated to put this right in part three of the constitution. And I first quote from the majority. As already pointed out, the right of privacy is not a guaranteed right under our constitution. And therefore the attempt to ascertain the movements of an individual, which is merely a manner in which privacy is invaded, is not an infringement of a fundamental right guaranteed under part three. In his dissent, Justice Subarao wrote, it is true our constitution does not expressly declare the right to privacy as a fundamental right, but the said right is an essential ingredient of personal liberty. Every democratic country sanctifies domestic life. It is expected to give him rest, physical happiness, 
peace of mind and security. In the last resort, a person's house where he lives with his family is his castle. It is his rampart against encroachment of his personal liberty. Indeed, nothing is more deleterious to a man's physical happiness and health than a calculated interference with his privacy. We would therefore, this is the minority, define the right to personal liberty in Article 21 as a right of an individual to be free from restrictions or encroachments of his person. And then he goes on to say this would be a violation of Article 21. The necessity for recognizing a privacy right moved the needle in the Supreme Court with a number of constitution benches recognizing that the minority view in Karak Singh was the correct position. This shift can be traced to the 11 judge bench judgment in Rustam Kavas G. Cooper versus Union of India, the seven judge uh, decision in Maneka Gandhi, and a five judge bench decision in Mohammad Arif versus Registrar General. In this march of law, privacy was but one of the rights that gained recognition amidst a new imagination that informed our understanding of fundamental rights. Rejecting a tight, restrictive, compartmentalized, provision-specific interpretation, the Supreme Court viewed various fundamental rights as supporting each other. Over three decades, an unbroken line of decisions recognized the existence of a right to privacy as being part of and protected under Part 3 of the Constitution, specifically the right to life guaranteed under Article 21. Building on Justice Subarao's dissent in Karak Singh, Justice Matthew in Gobind versus State of Madhya Pradesh steered the court to articulate an expanded notion of privacy founded on personal liberty. Individual autonomy, perhaps the central concern of any system of limited government, is protected in part under our constitution by explicit constitutional guarantees. And then he goes on to say, of course, privacy primarily concerns the individual. It therefore relates to and overlaps with the concept of liberty. Govind was a secret police picketing case as well, very similar to Karak Singh, and served as a springboard for the evolution of privacy jurisprudence case by case. Harboring no doubt that the right to privacy is an integral part of the right to life, the Supreme Court rendered judgments explaining the dimensions of privacy in cases relating to telephone tapping, prior restraint on publication of material on a death row convict, inspection and search of confidential documents involving bank and customer relationships, disclosure of HIV status, medical termination of pregnancy, scientific tests in criminal investigations, disclosure of bank accounts held overseas, the rights of transgender persons, and so on. Scores of judgments, dozens of judgments. And so many of us thought that the right to privacy appeared completely assured to Indian citizens until, and this was until the time that the Indian government launched the world's largest biometric harvesting exercise. In 2009, the central government created an administrative body called the UIDAI, the Unique Identification Authority of India, and made Aadhaar its brand and logo. Over the next several years, without any law to back the exercise, and this is important, there was no law, there was just an administrative instruction. Packaging their effort as voluntary, the government, through a network of private enrollers, began collecting the citizens' most sensitive biometric information. Apart from demographic information, such as your name and address, without counseling any individuals, the state obtained the fingerprints and the iris scans from every enrollee and stored these in a central depository. The purpose of this exercise was to authenticate the unique identity of a person by matching and validating the biometrics at a point of service identifier 
to the data stored with the government. This exercise was unprecedented in the democratic world. Aadhaar was rolled out without any public consultation and so swiftly that it took a long period for citizens to educate themselves and learn about the invasive nature of this program. What was central to this nation-wide biometric expropriation, harvest from citizens, was that the state, which we the people had established, was not treating our personal biometric information as ours, but as something that the state could summon at will. In other words, the eminent domain doctrine, the doctrine which is applied in the public interest by the state to take over land which is private property, was extended in a manner of speaking to your and my body and to our bodily integrity. Surely eminent domain cannot extend to our bodies and there can be no coercion by the state, our post-colonial constitutional state, to compel us to part with some of our most personal information our fingerprints and our iris scan. Surely a citizen has the freedom to identify herself in a manner she chooses. This is the core of personal individual freedom. I have a right to identify myself in any manner, in alternative manners, by producing different forms of identification, not just one form, not just my fingerprint or my iris scan. Choices are at a certain level the very heartbeat of any democracy. The absence of any lawful authority to collect biometrics on this enormous scale was so destructive to the rule of law that a number of petitions were filed before the Supreme Court. It seemed obvious to the petitioners that there could be no such massive incursion into their private sphere without so much as a law based merely on the administrative zeal of the UIDAI. Confronted with three decades of jurisprudence from the Supreme Court, recognizing the right to privacy, beginning with the clear articulation in Gobind, the government, and would you believe it, certain civil society organizations, resurrected the early MP Sharma and Karak Singh decisions to assert, sorry Indian citizens, the Supreme Court has got it wrong for 30 years. You have no fundamental rights to privacy. Our administrative program does not require the cover of law. The reason you required the cover of law was that if it were a fundamental right, the only manner in which you could justify the incursion was if the program was backed by a law. So the government said, sorry, you have no fundamental right. Privacy is not a fundamental right. Go back to MP Sharma, eight judges. This proved an effective ploy. The case stalled. The petitions which were filed in 20, 2012 and 13 were pushed on the back burner until the Chief Justice of India could spare nine judges to constitute a panel of adequate strength. This, this eventually happened in July 2017 by which time the program had rolled out across the country. On 24th August 2017, a nine-judge bench, 9-0, nine unanimously rejected the government's stand. They declared that the right to privacy is indeed a fundamental right that dwells in Article 21, as well as other fundamental rights guaranteed in 14, 19, and so on. The Puttaswamy decision contains a plurality of opinions rendered by five out of the nine judges. This judgment is likely to be a guiding lodestar in the near term. The nine judge decision in Puttaswamy elevates dignity. You had until last year uh, of renowned justice serving on the South African Constitutional Court which is their highest court, Justice Edwin Cameron. And I had an occasion to briefly ask him that, look, if you were to capture the spirit of the South African constitution in one word, what would that be? And he thought of it for just a moment 
and his answer was dignity. And to me that word dignity really summed up that entire battle which they had fought for decades through apartheid. Finally a peaceful transition and liberation much like our own and then moving towards a constitutional government. But for Cameron, the key, the core concept in that constitution was dignity. And the Indian Supreme Court elevates, therefore, in the nine-judge bench judgment, the notion of dignity which we find used in the preamble of our constitution. To live is to live with dignity. The judgment declares that the privacy is an element of human dignity and that the sanctity of privacy lies in its functional relationship to dignity. It's a very powerful thought and I, I think you have to, each one of you has to process it in your own ways, in your own time, when you look at dignity and the manner in which it plays out in the streets of India, in the colleges around you which you attend, in public life which we see through newspapers, through the cinema, through Instagram or whatever feed which you follow. Privacy recognizes the autonomy of the individual and the right to make essential choices which affect the course of her life, the Supreme Court said. Privacy is one of the core freedoms in the constitutional firewall against state interference. And this next quote is from Justice, now Chief Justice Bobde, but at that time he served on this panel. And I like it. He says, privacy is a traveling ra right. And I think this is something which the editors of Basu will put in because Basu is full of these, you know, pithy short statements. Privacy is a traveling right. It moves with you. It moves from situation to situation. You can't really peg it down and pin it down into a particular context. Privacy is a basic prerequisite for exercising liberty and freedom to perform other activities. Dignity, whose constitutional significance is acknowledged in the preamble to the Constitution, cannot be assured without privacy. Dignity and privacy are intimate, in, intimately uh, intertwined. Natural conditions for the enjoyment of freedom from birth of an individual and throughout her life. Privacy is inextricably bound with all exercise of human liberty, reflected in physical, informational, and decisional autonomy. Please remember this because this is going to have an echo throughout your lives because the most crucial factors for you are going to be your informational and decisional autonomy in the digital age. In today's world, privacy is a limit on the government's power as well as the power of private sector entities. After the nine judges unanimously recognized the fundamental right to privacy, the main case challenging the Aadhaar Act and the program's earlier administrative Aadhaar was placed before a bench of five judges. The only common judge was Justice D.Y. Chandrachun. How would the Constitution bench apply the reminted fundamental right to privacy? There were several issues before the court, and I will pick just two surveillance and the core notion of who owns our data including an individual's biometric indicators. Both these are issues at the core of an individual's privacy and both these issues drill into our freedoms, impact our behavior and alter our relationships with not just the state but also with corporations. Let me take the surveillance issue first because that is how the old cases of Kharak Singh and Gobind evolved. When Aadhaar was heard before the Supreme Court, the petitioners, for whom I was representing some of the petitioners, produced two expert affidavits. The first was from Samir Kelekar, an electrical engineer from IIT Mumbai, with a PhD from Columbia University, New York. In his affidavit of 6th April 2016, he said, and I'll just read one para, I have a long quote in the printed version, but I'll read one paragraph and then summarize the rest. That as someone with fairly extensive experience of cyber security, I can categorically state 
that this project is highly imprudent as it throws open the clear possibility of compromising basic privacy by facilitating real-time and non-real-time surveillance of UID, that's Aadhaar holders, by the Aadhaar, the UID authority and other actors that may gain access to the authentication records with the said authority or authentication data traffic. So this was an expert who went and filed an affidavit in the Supreme Court which was read and reread, who said that, look, I've studied the program. The manner in which this authentication works through our network of phones and the internet, you can locate where the person is pressing the fingerprint. Very similar to surveillance. Then there was Jude D'Souza, a security system specialist, and he in his affidavit says, that by way of illustration, the Aadhaar verification using a fingerprint reader is carried out, say, at an airport for boarding an aircraft or at a public distribution shop for collecting rations or for withdrawing money from an ATM, the state will know the precise location of the individual. This is without GPS. Remarkably, despite these powerful affidavits, during the hearing, neither the state nor the UIDAI could, on oath, through an expert, challenge these statements. One might have thought that this was surely a tipping point on which the Supreme Court would strike down Aadhaar. After all, our constitution is not a charter for a totalitarian state. Midway through the hearing, the government introduced the report of its foremost expert. Professor Manindra Agarwal, who holds the distinguished chair of N. Ramarao Professor of, at IIT Kanpur. He prepared a report on behalf of the UIDAI, and I will quote the next portion, which is directly from the Government of India's expert report. Finally, let us turn attention to verification log. Its leakage may affect both security and the privacy of an individual as one can extract identities of several people and also locate the places of transactions done by an individual in the past five years, tracking current location is possible. This was the Government of India's expert. After this report was read and re-read and re-emphasized in the Supreme Court, one might have fairly concluded that there was no way our Supreme Court is going to ignore the compelling material and allow a surveillance state to be established. The five-judge majority discounted the surveillance threat. How did it do so? Simple. The majority very simply chose not to deal with the affidavit of Dr. Samir Kelekar, nor the affidavit of J.T. D'Souza, nor even the government's expert report put in by Professor Manindra Agarwal. The majority turned a Nelson's eye to the evidence. Instead, it chose to rely on a PowerPoint presentation made by the CEO of the UIDAI. Now, I'm not very sure as to what they teach these days in law school, but when I was a student at the Government Law College, it was pretty clear that was what was stated on oath on affidavit had to be true and perfectly correct. And if it was wrong, you could be hauled up for perjury. So just imagine you have a Supreme Court of India which prefers a PowerPoint to the affidavit and a sworn report which has been placed by the government directly pointing out that if you allow this to work, you can be surveilled in real time. This is how fragile our liberties are. They can be trounced when the Supreme Court fails to summon constitutional courage. Now this notion of constitutional courage is again, like privacy, 
not an expression used in the Supreme Court, in the Constitution. But as citizens, each one of us has to exercise constitutional courage all the time, every time. That's a small price to pay for liberty. As far as institutions like the Supreme Court are concerned, I think the Constitution makes allowance for institutions such as this not to exercise constitutional courage every time, but they have to be able to summon the constitutional courage at crucial times. And it's my view that the Supreme Court faltered and failed in exercising constitutional courage at this decisive moment. There will be cases like this, and we will get chances to revisit these occasions, etc. But remember this, when you go out and practice law and you think that because you have all the affidavits on your side, it's now a slam dunk case, it's not so. The living experience of the law as it works out in court is sometimes a little different from what we read and learn in law school. Of course, the majority obliquely addressed surveillance by containing the Aadhaar project. They limited mandatory authentication to two purposes, a narrow set of government subsidies, benefits and services, and for authentication of identities for PAN cards. They eliminated the private sector from using Aadhaar as a platform. They prohibited mandating Aadhaar for children, particularly for school admissions, and held that mandatory linking to cell phones, bank accounts, etc. was illegal. These were the gains. From becoming an electronic leash that tethered a citizen from cradle to grave to a central government registry or repository, the court shrank Aadhaar and hoped that the invasion and tracking would be limited to once a month when one collected his or her rations or accessed other public benefits. The court also declared that the authentication records should not be maintained beyond six months. I might add that the minority judgment authored by Justice Chandrachud found the project illegal, invasive of privacy and liberty as it created a surveillance state. And he also opined that the money bill route was a fraud on the Constitution. I mean, just imagine, this is a 2018 judgment, and this issue of money bill in respect of the very same Finance Act has already been referred to seven judges. So that same Finance Act brought in the, uh, uh, brought in this whole, uh, the, the money bill route was used for Aadhaar and it was also used for certain tribunalization. And that element has already gone to the seven judge bench. That's again how frail what we think are our determinative constitution bench decisions sometimes are. This brings, this brings me to the second issue on which the court faltered. In the internet age, dominion and control over data dictates an amplitude of freedoms. Unless we recognize both through data protection laws and the application of robust principles that give each one of us charge of our data, the technology companies and the state will exploit this data. Data that you and I generate and they will exploit it for commercial gain. In a small twisted application, consider what UIDAI does and would have liked to do. It expropriates our biometrics, digitizes them and creates a massive data bank. It then charges third parties for every authentication against the biometrics that they obtained for free. Your fingerprints for our commerce could be the tagline for the UIDAI as it enters the world of surveillance capitalism. Of course, capitalism and Aadhaar are no strangers. The early growth of the Aadhaar program was mirrored by software developers some with a little insider knowledge, building a series of applications around the Aadhaar database. 
they decided to use the government database and mandatory linkages of Aadhaar number to create profiles and search backgrounds amongst the myriad other applications. The profile building denudes privacy. This new breed of data entrepreneurs who are at the vanguard of surveillance capitalism lobbied the government and secured the Aadhaar Amendment Act of 2019 which permits private parties voluntarily to use the Aadhaar database for authentication of identities. By leaping over the Supreme Court's curtailment, the government seeks to reinflate the Aadhaar balloon. Our battles to preserve privacy continue. There is, of course, an afterlife to the Aadhaar judgment in an expression that I borrow from the scholar Gautam Bhatia. Subsequent to the Aadhaar judgment, two other jurisdictions were called upon to evaluate the digital identity systems, Jamaica and Kenya. On 12th April 2019, a three-judge bench of the Supreme Court of Jamaica struck down the National Identification and Registration Act, declaring it null, void and of no legal effect. Two of the three judges referred to the Aadhaar judgment and particularly Justice Chandrachud's minority judgment. While there were key differences between the Jamaican judgment and Aadhaar, the program was struck down on the basis of the dangers of a centralized database and in particular the dangers of collecting biometrics. So this is really interesting that citizens in Jamaica benefited from our minority judgment. And when I look at it from a global perspective, I think this battle has to be fought at many fora. And I think towards the end, I will suggest to you that as some of you might have read in Yuval Harari's book, Homo Deus, uh, and his whatever, 20 or 21 point agenda for the 21st century, he speaks of a world where algorithms are probably going to rule us. And in a situation like that, of course, these individual battles are very important. But perhaps we have to decide these issues on a planetary level, as a species. The two great battles of this age are climate change and they are probably this battle against big tech and surveillance societies in terms of protecting our ancient freedoms. So the battles have to be fought locally. They have to be fought at every forum available. But eventually, maybe, I sometimes wonder, it's a decision which we as a species of Homo sapiens have to make. Do we want to go this way or do we want to go that way? But coming back to the Jamaica example, so what, what, what's, it's, it's part of the, uh, the, the, the development goals by 2030, the SDG uh, goals, that everyone must have an identification program. So what you had is the World Bank, which is also you know, at the vanguard of pushing technologies which are developed in many parts of the West, and here, as an aside, I might tell you that the government of India doesn't have proprietary rights on any of these vital and crucial technologies which do the exercise of deduplication. So we are really licensees. I mean, that is, it's not far from here that, I mean, whatever, 300 years ago, you had the entry of the East India Company and you had corporations which eventually ruled us through, of course, colonialism and the colonial, uh, colonial powers for centuries. And you now have a situation where this country's most vital data is being stored in programs and servers. The servers are, of course, owned by us, but through programs with foreign corporations having access to this. And if you review the literature, you will find that many of these four foreign corporations who have provided the technology for this are really mixed up with defense contractors for a vast number of overseas companies. So there's really no certainty when we're talking about the integrity of India. 
the sovereignty of India. I mean, who's in charge? Who's running this show? But anyway, coming back, so you have this World Bank, and the whole idea was that we'll push this through India, and then there'll be Africa to, and, you know, the Caribbean, etc. No one is trying to push a program like this with a centralized repository in any of what we describe as the first world countries. No one's even trying that because it would be treated as so bad. I mean, they may be doing it clandestinely like the NSA, which uh, was exposed by Edward Snowden. That's a different issue. But this is a formal issue on the surface. So the Aadhaar judgment of the Supreme Court by containing Aadhaar at least blocked this enormous invasion which was going to take place. And so the first full stop was Jamaica who accepted the minority in India and said the minority judgment was right. We are not going to allow this kind of a centralized digitization of maintaining tracking of records at all. And then it came up before the Kenyan High Court and we have a January 2020 decision in, uh, of the Kenyan High Court which has also said that, well, that, that program is also fairly similar to Aadhaar in the sense that it collects biometrics and wants to issue a unique number in terms of access. Now, the key takeaway from that court is that the government has been asked to by the High Court to review and to come up with appropriate and comprehensive regulatory frameworks. What is clear, however, that the court has acknowledged, the Kenyan High Court, a law that affects the fundamental right of freedom should be clear and unambiguous and this applies to any law that seeks to protect or secure personal data, particularly in the light of grave effects of breach of data already allu alluded to. I thought I would just give you the headline points from a recent uh, article by Professor Daniel, uh, Daniel Solov and well, maybe it's Solvay, I, I'm not sure. And he titles this paper as the myth of the privacy paradox. And he enumerates, and I thought this was useful, as to why is privacy valuable. And I'll just give you his headline points. He first says it limits power. Privacy is a limit on the power of government and companies. The more someone knows about us, the more people they can have over uh, the more power they can have over us. Personal data is used to make very important decisions in our lives and personal data can be used to affect our reputations. So he talks about limits of power, both state as well as corporate, respect for individuals, privacy is about respecting individuals. He talks about an important, he flags an important notion here, reputation management. Unless we have our data private and control it, we perhaps cannot manage our reputations. Maintaining op appropriate social boundaries. I mean, if the person whom you meet, for example, knows everything about you, and, you know, uh, uh, in terms of the absence of privacy, that could really harm social interactions. It could undermine trust, and therefore the importance of privacy in retaining trust, in control over one's life, and then he comes to the traditional points, which I hope to dwell on a bit. Freedom of thought and speech, freedom of social and political activities, the ability to change and have a second chance. And if you recall, Edward Snowden's recent book is titled Permanent Record. Because in the digital age, no matter what you try and erase and what you try and remove, there is a permanent record somewhere of what you have done. The ability to change and have a second chance, protection of intimacy, bodies and sexuality, not having to justify or explain oneself. I think that's very important. I mean, surely in a democracy, we must have the freedom to choose and the freedom to do as we like without having to explain ourselves. Do I have another five or seven minutes? Okay, so then let me just come to the internet age and here I'll just wrap up by, I use the word uh, surveillance capitalism and that's the title of a fabulous book by Professor Shoshana Zuboff and she says that what she studied big tech and what she found essentially, just three or four takeaways from this massive tome was 
she describes the present type of capitalism which uses data that you and I generate as a rogue form of capitalism. So she harks back to the 1800s and says, look, capitalism has undergone these changes. There was child labor. There was all sorts of exploitation which went on in the name of capitalism. But society reacted, responded and tamed capitalism, which is why it survives with all its imp imperfections today. But she says this rogue surveillance capitalism is so asymmetric. These big tech companies know everything about us and we know next to nothing about them. One. Number two, they seem to be so far ahead that by the time we catch up in terms of the technologies, etc. and understanding them, they moved to a whole other level. Again, emphasizing and underscoring the asymmetry. And then she points out that what these companies are doing is they are in the business of selling predictions about you and me. On the basis of the data which they gather, they can know or they can predict. And these prediction markets are very, very valuable. So you've seen it in the crudest form. You type in something about a place which you want to visit and you will get three or four hotel advertisements, for example, from that particular place. But it's far, far more advanced now. And what surveillance capitalism is now doing is that if both of us were going for the same, say, hotel room or airline ticket, Mr. Divan very possibly might be offered a much higher price the same ticket, the same seat, the same room, because it's done some sort of a profile check on both of us and said that no, the vice chancellor has an office which goes through scrupulously seven or eight alternative flights and sites and books the most economical and the most convenient one. And Mr. Divan has no time and he just takes the first one. So let's offer the same room for a higher price. Let's pick it up. So the data which has been generated from me, I have had no control over it and that's been used to exploit me in a capitalist sense. And it's reaching levels where insurance companies are altering their premiums based on our behavior. And then, apart from the capitalism part, it tips into, and we've seen this, into the politics. And where you have data mining which goes on and on and which creates a profile of the type of individuals we are and then targets us for a certain type of listening or for a certain type of advertisement or a certain type of news which would be palatable and acceptable to us and moves us in a particular direction. Therefore, I would submit and I would urge all of you to think about this very hard that we have to somehow, and the data protection bill probably moves us in this direction, we have to be pretty conscious of what we are sharing. We have to take the effort to fight these battles in terms of preserving and protecting our privacy, difficult as they are, because as we know, we are all the time pressing that I agree button where, and yielding to our privacy. So that's where the importance of the data protection regime, which hopefully will come in in India in a short while, will matter. That we have ownership of our data individually, that we know and can control for what it can be used. We have to probably reconcile ourselves and move to a world where not everything is free on the internet because it's the only manner in which, they, at the moment, they say it's free, but they're harvesting such a lot of your own personal information and utilizing that through big data and machine uh, uh, reading that they're using it eventually in a manner of speaking against you. But I do wish to end on a positive note. And the positive note is that, well, we've got a whole full or near full of young bright minds who are, I think, entrusted with these liberties, with these constitutional values, who are going to fight, not just for themselves, but for generations to come, 
and even for past generations such as myself who probably faltered and not been very successful because you're the ones really who are going to have to educate yourselves and eventually and at the end of the day fight identify these new battles and take them forward thank you very much for your time and i believe that this is very productive and interesting and thought evoking i why i use the word thought evoking is this because throughout his judge, uh, lecture he tried to confirm one thing say one thing that the what should be our future in this digital era so now i tell you that if anybody uh, you can come forward to raise your questions yes so you mentioned this idea of informational uh, autonomous as well as physical um, sort of autonomy you know being allowed to be let alone in the context not only of your decisions and your information but also your physical being um sir do you see that in a constitution where the writers of the constitution after a freedom struggle chose to retain preventive detention that this new idea of privacy and of autonomy could perhaps change the way preventive detention and uh, incursions upon physical autonomy are allowed and placed within constitution jurisprudence i think the manner in which the test of a nine judge bench judgment is well it lays down the broad principles but ultimately if you want to give teeth to that particular judgment you're going to have to see as to how it is enforced in individual cases and i think in pre preventive detention cases for the present it's not going to be some immediate impact that you're certainly going to find that uh, courts will view this issue very very differently because courts will generally look at it from a textual aspect from that specific law under which the detention has taken place so yes it does elevate in the mind of a judge that look there is a privacy uh, a value that has been now elevated it is tied in with dignity etc but ultimately when it comes to both the police the bureaucracy and the judge who are the three key decision makers in this process they'll be guided by the black letter law and if the black letter law continues to allow detention that is probably likely to continue as well uh so since you spoke about uh data ownership and uh the idea of uh, surveillance capitalism i had a two fold question uh one was with respect to uh section 91 of the personal data protection bill which sort of enables the government to exercise eminent domain over anonymized personal data my question to you is is there a reasonable expectation of privacy over data which is anonymized uh and my uh second question is uh the bill also creates a framework for consent managers which is similar to account aggregators which are regulated by the reserve bank of india i wanted to know in the age of interoperability to what extent can this enable surveillance capitalism in india uh, look as far as uh, reasonable expectation of privacy is concerned uh, it's a traveling right it will always be there according to me i mean you can't expect you i, I think the citizen is entitled to say that look if i'm giving my data for x or y or z reason it's not going to be used for reasons a b and c the problem currently is that one of course we have no data protection regime of that sort at all so what your data is being mined for is based on a contract which no one has read so that's the major problem over here but i think as far as reasonable expectation of privacy is concerned i think that's a fairly well entrenched value which will continue and which will uh, remain as far as in, uh, uh, as far as uh, technologies are concerned and the manner in which they move forward including aspects regarding surveillance capitalism i think that battle is not going to have is is going to have to be fought on a much broader and bigger level at a planetary level virtually so yes there is things which india can do there are probably things the european union could do there are probably some murmurs and shouts in terms of anti trust as far as big tech is concerned in the united states of america but ultimately we are going to have to be able to decide or we are going to have to decide for ourselves 
are we going to allow a few corporations to know just about everything for, uh, uh, about us based on and stored in some server for the rest of our lives or are we going to have to make that difficult choice two choices actually one that we are going to have to regulate the internet and if so on what principles and two this whole notion which we've got so accustomed to that everything which we do on the internet is free are we going to have to compel ourselves to move away from that and pay by pay i don't mean we necessarily individuals have to pay maybe the model can be that there is some more general system of taxation by which the tax is taken paid to a particular service provider in a small measure but your privacy is protected so that service provider doesn't know everything about you and can pass it on to x or y or z so thank you firstly for your enlightening speech uh, this uh, i happen to teach privacy at the university and i think you've covered almost every module i intended to touch upon through the course of that lecture but so i have a couple of questions relating to the supreme court decisions and a couple others relating to data if that's okay um the first is uh, technically whether there was a need for the reference to the nine judge bench in the first place a number of scholars have argued that it was unnecessary considering that mp sharma the judgment uh, restricted itself to, to the, the question of 20 sub clause 3 and that kharak singh had been discredited the majority opinion of kharak singh had been discredited long before that's the first the second is a uh, 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 would you say that in your opinion the supreme court sort of diluted its own dignity during the putaswami 2 decisions when uh, decision when it applauded the government's efforts to uh, you know get 100% enrollment whereas this uh, these efforts were made essentially in contravention to its own orders the supreme court as we all know had uh, made a number of orders asking the government to stop the exercise till the case was decided so on data a couple of things one was re with regards to the question of data deletion which uh, justice chandrachur in his dissenting opinion in adhar mentioned that uh, the data that has been already captured by the corporates since the majority decision also has the effect of taking away private uh, verification of adhar through adhar uh, what happens to the data that has already been captured these were essentially my questions i think well i'll take the third question first because i don't think anyone knows Uh, uh, we don't even know where our data has been stored we don't know whether there are the uidi says that it's stored only with them but you will periodically see for example uh, data uh, news reports coming up there's a set of news reports which have come out from gujarat for example because obviously the gujarat public distribution system is using it's not probably the uidi servers and their data but they are using some authentication which is based on fingerprints because you are having these arrests which are made and fingerprint duplication which seems to be working over there so there so we really don't know where this there, there was a whole point on state resident data hubs so we don't even know where these data are stored we don't know uh, the government is very cagey about this uh, so data destruction is the next level which is if we know what is stored where we will know that it ought to be destroyed but i can quite see this happening in the future maybe someone will take up this issue and require a destruction to be made uh, on the on the technical point of whether it ought to have gone up to nine judges uh, this argument was raised before a bench of uh, three justices there was justice chalmeshwar who was presiding there was justice uh, bobde who's now chief justice to his left as you face the bench and there was justice nagappan uh, to his right when the government of india said that look there's no way nine judges and then you know there was some whispering and smiling going on on the bench and nobody knew what uh, they were talking about and we were obviously saying exactly what you mentioned namely that you had 11 judge and nine judge bench uh, subsequent decisions which which had explained that the minority that, that gobind was correct that it taken it forward the whole law structure change so i would agree there was probably no necessity but i think the bench which i mentioned on that day felt that uh, uh, there has to be a discipline in this court and if uh, the attorney general has pointed out an eight judge bench judgment the only way we can really look past it is uh, in a, in a disciplined manner is to get nine judges to clarify the exact position and then to apply it so to that extent i think there was a degree of discipline though i would still say that there was no need to send it up basically they played into the hands of the government by postponing the project because we you, you're never going to get nine judges to sit over there in the supreme court unless they want to sit in your case 
and you know the government doesn't want to hear Aadhaar a challenge. The Supreme Court has other fish to fry. So why get into this? The other point, uh, yeah, well, on the breach of their own orders. Uh, look, um, when, when you look at the with the act at uh, and you look at the Supreme Court judgment as a whole, uh, which is the majority opinion is by Justice Sikri. Um, I don't think it has the degree of rigor uh, and analysis which you would expect of a case where huge amount of effort has been put, uh, put in by all sides in trying to get a nice, sharp and good answer, whatever it be. So maybe they were very pressured in terms of time. Maybe there were certain other factors in terms of, you know, the negotiation process, which is inevit inevitable in a contentious issue like this, which judges must do before they actually render a judgment or uh, issue an opinion. And so it falls short in terms of analysis uh, and therefore eventually, in my view, in terms of credibility across many, many uh, 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 subjects or topics. And one of them would be that uh, they weren't willing to really stand up and hold, uh, they needn't have gone as far as contempt is concerned, but to stand up for your own orders was, I think, a very important uh, factor in terms of establishing yourself, uh, your, your institutional status in the larger scheme of things. And perhaps uh, you could argue that uh, the Supreme Court, um, you know, didn't come to uh, its highest standards uh, at in, in, on that issue. It's about considering the way in which our constitutional courts have been very reluctant to pass appropriate interim orders or effectively ensure that these programs are not rolled out pending adjudication. From a strategic point of view, I'm asking you as a lawyer, would trying to approach the civil court or trying to bring in the ordinary civil courts into the system, do you think that would have produced some better results? At least we can give evidence and probably convince a judge better than what's happening in the constitutional courts. Look, I think that's a very important point which you make. Uh, I think we don't use fora other than our courts adequately, one. And we don't use our courts other than our constitutional courts adequately either. I accept that. But please remember what the government of India does in cases such as this and what is very likely to happen at you know the request of the government by the supreme court the cases get transferred so many of the petitions which came up and which were decided by the supreme court in what we know as puttaswami were not necessarily matters which were filed for the first time in the supreme court they got transferred from various high courts because the government simply says that look you have the power we can't be battling this across a very far but i think on issues which are probably not as uh, as a matter of strategy i think i i would admire uh, and probably adopt your suggestion you must go to a forum which is capable of giving you the relief you seek if you already know that you're not ever going to get this relief from a particular forum for whatever reason then there's no point going there and perhaps the time has come for us to explore the civil courting in many parts of the country, the process through our civil courts is so slow that, uh, I mean, you would just, you know, you'd be all kind of dead by the time you got a verdict. Uh, sir, in fact, uh, uh, as you rightly observed, that in the future, in fact, is under the scope of the algorithm that you spoke about, which is basically nothing but the artificial intelligence, per se. Uh, so far, I'm uh, correctly understanding about that. Uh, my issue is about somewhere else. When we are speaking about the privacy perspective, uh, even the movements are also quite uh, specific issues like the uh, Sundar Pichai so being questioned uh, from the Google's perspective, like when the clients are using the Google map, in fact, their locations are compromised uh, appropriately in this regard. Though the Sundar Pichai, uh, in fact, uh, came out from the situation saying like it's an option left to the client who is uh, basically taking that particular help of the revealing the location or not. But otherwise, when you're speaking about the uh, conflict between the military defense also at the same time, intelligence, uh, they are uh, always making live streaming on the individuals who are making movement, uh, maybe in the name of national security per, per se. But uh, we have found that uh, recently India has also launched a very good satellite in this regard, uh, having uh, you know like uh, one inch uh, particular uh, demography, which differently can be with high resolution can be uh, updated in their own server. 
as uh, just we were speaking about that. Uh, so where is exactly the privacy also remains from that perspective and also regarding when we are moving to cities having lots of uh, CC cameras, CCTV cameras are also available which also come from somewhere about the location of the concerned persons. I mean like whether there is any future version available of the privacy. But uh, more than that, I think perhaps when we are speaking about the environmental law perspective, uh, in constitutionalism of the environmental law, is there a scope of maintaining the privacy? at least for the industries to get a defense uh, in terms of pollution control. And my, this is the first question. Second is about like uh, environmental and policies, uh, one of the important book uh, that uh, we generally read all. Uh, Professor Amin Ranjikan also uh, at the same time is a co-author in that regard. So uh, it's a very, uh, you know, a very good piece of the environmental books of available in India at this moment uh, with the 2002 edition, last one. So, sir, when we are expecting uh, the latest edition of the book at the same time. <laughs> Thank you so much. I apologize to all those who still use that environment law book for not coming out with the new edition. Uh, look, I, I, I'll let you in on a secret. I've, I've completed the first sort of background for the whole of it and I've completed a semi-final version up to chapter 8 out of chapter 16. So, I mean, we were so, so this May or June is going to be the crucial thing. I know, let's, we're trying to push it out, but that's just an aside. On, on the, uh, you know, the other question which you raised regarding CCTV cameras with regard to facial recognition, which is now coming in in a huge way. I mean, just imagine if you're going to, you, you, you've all read about the social audit scores which are happening in uh, China, for example. So you cross a street, imagine, in there are certain streets which you cross in China and the traffic light will tell you, Mr. So-and-so, why did you? jump, you know, so and so. They know, they've recognized you already and it'll also remind you that you haven't sort of whatever, paid some municipal bill or something of that sort. And then if you want to keep your social score correct uh, or high, you have to ensure that you don't cross, I mean, you cross at the zebra crossing and you don't jump onto the road before uh, the pedestrian crossing turns green. So that's how far it can go or it's already gone. And I think this is a choice which we are going to have to make as a society. Uh, I mean, I am just astonished actually. There are CCTV cameras, I don't know about West Bengal, but the Delhi government mandates CCTV cameras in schools. And you have a popular support because it's in classrooms, it's not just in the corridors or something like that. And parents are happy to see whether the teacher is actually teaching their students and stuff like that. I mean, I think we have to really rethink as a society uh, in, because of the new technologies such as facial recognition which you mentioned and CCT cameras, uh, CCTV cameras becoming pervasive as to whether this has, whether this is not already impacting each one of us in the manner in which we behave, in the manner in which we interact and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think in schools, children, you know, you may have an isolated case of bullying you may have a case for even if there is a, if the school counselor or somebody says that look there's a real problem or there is a specific issue in a class maybe you can have a class or something which has cctv camera but to have it across all corridors in all schools etc and uh, elsewhere i think is, a, is 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 something which each one of you have to really think whether it's worth the while you spoke about in terms of surveillance do exist in the personal data protection bill too and even if we assume it's helpful how do you think this idea of like free consent will work in a society where you said there's data illiteracy information asymmetry and in cases where people do require the subsidies in like to subsist first of all feel that as far as the data protection bill we're not sure exactly how it'll come out but there's certain principles over there in terms of data rights which are very important the unfortunate part of this bill, I don't want to get into a big debate on that, is that the final authority, which is supposed to be your data protection authority, doesn't appear to have any degree of autonomy. And there are so many exceptions, it's like a sieve through which everything can leak. That's one part. The other part is that I'm not even sure whether as a society, since you mentioned it, uh, we, are, we have sufficient redress mechanisms if there is a hack or if some data takes is taken away and whether we have a system which can which can work through that entire uh, process you know the other uh, uh, aspects with regard to the manner in which your whole uh, uh, 
you mentioned, for example, that there's a huge amount of illiteracy or lack of. I think we have to think: Are we going to have a system by which we have some degree of regulation? So it doesn't mean a regulation. I don't mean necessarily a governmental regulator. It could be an autonomous private regulator who comes up with best practices, etc., with in relation to how individuals and corporations can interact. How state governments and individuals, uh, and the, how the state and individuals can interact, how individuals can interact with each other in terms of the data which they transfer. Because unless we have that, this data which you and I generate is going to be all over, and it's going to hit us in manners which we can scarcely imagine and anticipate. There's also a lot of good which can come out through this data mining, which I think everyone recognizes. For example, in medicine, for instance. You can, you, uh, you know, metadata can be very, very useful in identifying problems, in finding solutions uh, to issues long before individual practitioners can actually come through. So I'm not saying all metadata is bad, but what are the purposes for which you can use it? There has to be a purpose restriction and a limitation, because if we don't have that limitation and we don't fight for that now, um, uh, you're going to find uh, your political and social freedoms severely eroded in the years ahead. Thank you. I, I think that has to be done and looked at case by case and situation by situation. Because both the expressions which you used, liberty and privacy, are so vague and general in one sense, though we know what it means in another sense. But in different situations, it, it plays out differently. So I think in terms of, for, for I think what uh, some thinkers, and I, I quoted from Edward Snowden, what they say is that in a digital universe, what, you know, the American revolutionaries, what they fought for, the founding fathers of their constitution, they use the expression liberty, the French revolution uses the word liberty, our constitution uses the word liberty. But he asks the question that, look, in a digital world, what is liberty? And he basically says that, because these machines can mine all your data, if you want to preserve political rights and be free, and you don't want to be tethered and told by the government what to do, then that data has to be protected. And to protect that data of yours, which you yourself are generating, don't al allow others to exploit it. And if you don't want to allow others to exploit it, and you want to allow it to be protected, then that comes under the hat of privacy, generally. Sir, you are a very good speaker, but I have just one simple question. That is, the Aadhaar is applied only within the country, in India. I am saying in the case of Western democracies, is an Aadhaar-like system where biometrics is used. Does it prevail there? No, you see, ours, uh, just to answer it directly, uh, there are two or three things about Aadhaar. The first is they've taken biometrics. The second is it's virtually compulsory, though they say it's voluntary. The third is that they've stored it in a central authentication register or the central repository. Yes. And the fourth is they allow real-time matching. So if you put it, they'll say that, yes, this is X, this is Y, or this is not X, or this is Y. This hasn't been tried anywhere at all. And it's not likely to be accepted anywhere at all, anywhere in the world, because you may have someone taking digital uh, uh, images or fingerprints, for example, uh, when you enter a country or you leave a country. You know, you may have some test over there. So, but then that's localized to that particular airport. It's not going to follow you throughout at, at, at every point you do it. If you remember, before the Supreme Court judgment in Aadhaar, they had asked you to link it to your bank accounts, yes. link it to your phone, etc. So the idea then was that if you went to an ATM, supposing you were paying, say, for an Uber or yeah. whatever, you could just give your fingerprint, it will debit your account. Now, when you have a network like that which develops, they can track your every movement in real time across the country, etc. So that becomes, you know, whole time surveillance. So that's, that's the concern. But it doesn't happen in any, in any other part of the world. And the second thing which you said about the uh, camera, doesn't it help detect crime? Well, I think what it does is that it may in some occasions help solve 
crimes in certain situations. It helps solve. So I think you're, you're absolutely right that it's a question of uh, weighing the benefits against what we are losing. So it's a question perhaps sometimes of moderation, sometimes of scale. I don't think we can, I don't think anyone is arguing no CCTV cameras anywhere. But the issue I raised was do you want them in your schools? Do you want them in your classrooms? I don't think you can have them in hospitals, uh, frankly, because you don't want to tell the rest of the world that this is happening. You know, tomorrow someone will hack the feed and say that XYZ was seen in this hospital. Oh, he's got this, he's got that. I mean, these are the spheres. Maybe some people are very proud of the fact that they went to hospital and, you know, were admitted. But th so those are some of the, I think, issues which come up. But thank you very much.